What's going on guys? Gunner here. Welcome to episode 4 of Tie Like a Pro. This is part 3. Uh, starting to wrap this thing up here and today's all about swim bugs. And basically uh, my interpretation of a swim bug is basically an articulating fly. So you're talking about water push heads um, uh, basically built around this weightless or a, a, a buoyant platform. Typically they're done with deer hair or they're done with bucktail. Um, I, it's my kind of personal preference like you can do like a synthetic uh, Buford head like this is a fuzz senior right um, and it's strung fuzzy fiber so you can make a weightless synthetic head um, and that kind of blends categories I'm not sure if that would be a, a swim bug and an articulating bug but it, it blends categories and I'll basically I want to go over two simple um, head variations we're gonna do a zoo cougar head and I'm gonna show you how to stack deer hair real quick real simple and we'll go over shaping a cougar head and and some of the considerations for stability and how to get some belly wobble out of that um, why it's kinda of shaped the way it is stuff like that and then I want to do a, a very simple uh, basically a spun head and I'm gonna kinda leave it loose like a mini Buford and we'll again we'll just go over kinda stability it's kinda like in a, a fat head or doing a bulk head or doing you know a Buford or a mini Buford it's kinda like a muddler but a little bit bigger um, and I'm gonna try to keep it kind of in the trout range um, for articulating flies and again you could do that with a synthetic but it wouldn't have that buoyant property um, these are all weightless or buoyant they're all designed for full sinking lines short leaders um, same with jerk flies I didn't mention that in the jerk fly video but same with jerk flies uh, you can also run those on intermediate lines and sink tips um, but for the most part it's a full sink game so that's what we're doing that's what's going on um, the kind of beautiful thing about swim bugs a lot of times is the buoyancy and the interplay of the buoyancy with the sink tip. Um, they have a long hover and, and, and they catch a lot of current and there's just something suspenseful about it but they have enough push and drag to get tail kicks. It's, it's a really awesome system. Um, so props to KG and, and all the guys who kind of developed these heads. Um, and we're going to focus on Kelly's cougar head. Uh, this what I have in the vise is a skinny dipper, which is a Kelly Gallup uh, fat head minnow or heifer groomer. Same fly, different names. It's a variation of that, uh, kind of built out of an EP brush chassis. So let's, let's dive into the head design. Hopefully I'll keep this video short and sweet, under 20 minutes. Um, so yeah, we'll be moving quick. So I'm coming in here. Um, basically, we're going to use deer body here. For a collar in her head, right? You're looking for a nice a long fiber, about two inches or so. You want a nice clean color line. Basically, everything below that color line is going to be hollow and compressed for you. No colics. You want it to feel a little coarse so you don't have a ton of under fur in there. On the underside, we're actually going to use deer belly hair. Um, and it's a little bit coarser, has a little bit more flair to it, usually a wider diameter, so you can use a little bit less to kind of fill up your underside. It's a little bit harder to find high quality uh, belly hair. I'd recommend definitely finding this in person. You're looking for the same stuff, but it doesn't have that color uh, line in it. Um, but you just want to touch it, make sure it's nice, hollow, kind of coarse, good long fiber length to it, no colic. So, I got my body hair in a Magnum hair packer. Even out the tips. Setting the collar on this and setting the collar on like the sex dungeon that we did last week. Same principles, same process. You can see I have a little th uh, thread bump right here. I got thread dams um, that I'm going to stack my collar in that controls my spacing. And I'm coming in, it's a little sparse, but I'm going to keep it anyway. Um, and something I forgot to mention, it's a point I really want to drive home on this one, but collar length, right? I talked about being a third of the body. And I kind of missed this when I was trying to explain it. Um, but if you th consider your tail, and then you have a hook shank and a hook shank, right? Most tails are going to be a hook shank or so. They're probably going to be longer than a hook shank. Um, so you really have three hook shanks. I mean, you have your tail, your actual shank, and then your front shank. So if your collar is the length of your front shank, it's a third of your body. So aim for that shank length or slightly longer, um, and you'll be right in the ballpark of, uh, of a good third of basically your, your fly. Right, we got a nice clean cut, we got a nice vertical edge. We're gonna come in with a nice loose wrap. If your, th your thread should fall onto your finger, if it doesn't, right, throw a little bit of counterclockwise spin in that. Gonna add a little bit of pressure. Gonna come back up with another wrap, a little bit more pressure, another wrap, and now I'm gonna pull straight down. I'm gonna come under with my finger so that it can't rotate. 
I'm going to put some turns through the butts and move up onto my shank and half hitch. Now I'm just going to clean this up with scissors real quick. And then same as on the dungeon, right? I have all my hair on top. I want to take my thumb, push directly into that, and move it off to the sides because I want a nice wide profile, right? These are suckers. These are chubs, sculpins, and gobies. I want the nice wide uh, fat head profile that's kind of imitating this enlarged gill, uh, gill pack and gill area. Kind of comb that out. Then I like to wrap back up into these butts, help secure that, take out some thread, do a loose wrap, and help uh, kind of push that down and collapse it. Now you'll see, if you ever see me do a cougar head, in which case, um, I mean, that's what we're doing, but uh, typically a zoo cougar is spun. Today we're gonna stack, because um, I wanna show you the difference. Um, but typically when I spin, I'll leave about an extra hook eye up here and I'll do two spins. But when I stack, I like to just do one stack top and bottom. Um, I just, there's something about working with it. It's really hard to do two stacks right next to each other with a little bit of hair. It's kind of pointless. Like I'd rather do one big stack top and bottom than mess with trying to pack everything back and fit it in there. Um, so this is just why I do it that way. I just prefer to do one stack top and bottom. Uh, so I shorten my shank length left between my collar and my eye to facilitate that. So we're going to come in with our first spin. You don't need a rotary vise, by the way, to stack hair. We're going to walk this around the hook, put it on the bottom, put a stack on top. So I'm coming in with my belly hair. Now, uh, we, we're not going to, well, you don't need a ton of hair. It's about the same as your collar. All right, you're going to keep your butts flush. Comb those out, get all the under fur out of there, get all your short hairs out of there. And then we're going to, cut our tips off because we're not going to need those. Now working with um, hair is, is tricky so I'm going to do my best here. But whenever you grab it, the goal is to grab it at the midpoint, right? Because that's where you're going to put your wraps right against your fingers. You want the hair to flare 50-50 for the most part. It's going to create the kind of bulkiest, most consistent head. Now you hold this on your hook and you can hold it. You can see this. You can hold that at a slight Oh, you can't see that. Uh, basically, you just hold it over your hook. <laughs> it can be angled. You can see it's like below my hook eye out here. It doesn't really matter. Um, but you kind of use your hand in this mass to hold your collar back so it's out of your collar's way. And I'm going to pull out just enough thread with a loose wrap. Then when I kind of touch bottom here, it's going to add some tension. Pull out a little more. Add some tension. So I have two and a half turns on that, and I'm going to basically flare it, right? Now I'm going to walk this around the hook, but I have a little bit of thread on there, so it's not going to go super easy. And that's good. I, I want that thread so that the head doesn't really spin. Um, so I'm going to help it by pushing up with my thumb here. And you can see that hair walk right underneath. Uh, missed a little bit right there. Walk underneath, and then I'm going to flare that. If you have, and I'll try to show you this, you can see my hair on top. It's, it's not... Um, you might have some trapped hair. You might have some hair that's kind of crisscross or figurated. And you just take your bodkin, you want to clean that up. Again, I'll push down right on top and pull straight down. And what you want to do, this is it's super important, but you want to support your hook eye. Support your hook eye with your thumb, your finger comes on top. Now you put something on top so the hair has something to flare against without going up. You know, you see what I'm saying? If it has your finger pressure on top, it'll flare flat instead of flaring up into your, and up into the actual head part. You just want it on the bottom, right? I didn't tie that in perfectly 50-50, but I think when I trim it, it'll, I'll be able to save it here. Now I'm going to come in with my same collar here, so I'm coming in with Dan. Again, clean out the butts, right? Same as before. Um, and we're just going to stack it right on top. I like to use slightly more hair on top than bottom, right? The top is what's going to be shaped. The top is what's going to have volume. It's what you're basically going to use to create a miniature kind of diving head. Um, and it needs to be the widest. And it helps it ride right, right? The more buoyancy you put on top, the better, the more likely that's going to ride correctly, land correctly, and fish correctly. So I got slightly more material, just say like 10% or something going to rest this 50-50, right? That's not a hard thing. You just plop that right on top. The hand switch is a little tricky, but it's just a loose loose grab. Pull out some thread that shouldn't spin on you because I had a slight thread base. It's going to help grip that. Wiggle your thread up and through, down. Now you're going to want to come through the same uh, path that you made 
when you originally trap that deer hair. I'm just going to add a little bit of tension and add a little bit of tension. Release my hand, pinch right underneath that head so that hair doesn't rotate. If you wanted that to bleed, right, you could, you could kind of shove your thumb on top and help that to bleed a little bit. But I'm just going to compress that and I'm going to hold my hook eye when I compress that. That way I can get a good amount of force on that. Use that GSP, right, we're tying with GSP. I'm going to push that back so I can come up and find my hook eye here. Now all I have is three turns of thread on that deer hair, right? And when you catch that hook eye, you still only have that three, I guess you got three and a half. And it's kind of important, right? That gel spun allows you to keep that under tension because it doesn't have any stretch and it's super slick. So when I bring this plastic bag over and I back my thread through that plastic bag, I'm still directly attached to that deer hair. I still have the same amount of turns over my deer hair. I can put one clean wrap and some good force and now that's all tightened down and it's not going to slip or rotate or loosen or back off. We'll put down a good thread base. The gel spun's nice because you can kind of build up a, a little dam against that eye and force it back because it's super slick. I need to kind of pack that back a little bit more. Sweet. Then I'm going to come in and whip finish. If you're just joining us, I'm making a few assumptions that you've watched some of the other videos, you know, talking about spinning thread, talking about this uh, paper bag trick, talking about some deer hair properties. So uh, please make sure you go back and watch the other Tie Like a Pro videos to get caught up to speed here. But something I love doing, I found this helped a lot with my consistency, right? You stack the hair top and bottom and you try to flare it. If you come in with your fingers, and these are just top and bottom, you can see how kind of flat that is. But I love to shove my fingers in there just like the collar, and I'm doing sides, right? I'm doing sides and top, and it's just really helping round out that head. Um, any loose fibers are gonna distribute and kind of fill in, and you'll get this super clean, kind of full head that's gonna trim up a little bit nicer than if you leave things mostly top and mostly bottom, right? Same way you did the collar, you stacked it on top, spread it out. That hair was kind of like two dense pockets, top and bottom, and I want it to spread out and meld together. So that's what I'm doing there. Now, uh, same thing as before. I love to trim things in my hand. If you can do it in the vise, that's cool. Um, feel free to do that, but I'm going to do this in my hand. Most importantly, I'm going to get a new razor blade. Just like a cougar head, just like the sex dungeon head that we did, flat bottom. And I'll back this out here. Flat bottom, super important. Flat bottom stability. Um, it's also going to help you use that hook keel. It's going to help that fly ride correctly, track through the water correctly. And I'll show you how to destabilize it on purpose to get some belly wobble. But I'm just going to come in, cut that nice and flat. Now that we got our bottom super tight, super flat, looking super nice, all you got to do is make a rectangle. Leave the, the edges as wide as you can for the most part. Um, I'll show you some scissor work to kind of clean that up. But just make a simple box, right? You want to just kind of come up from your hook eye. Um, and I'm, again, this another uh, same trick from the sex engine head. Hold that collar down. You can't cut your collar off if you hold it with your fingers, right? Hold that down. I got my rubber legs in there with my hand. And I'm going to come up and kind of Cut that deer hair straight flush so it's vertical. Kind of cut it straight up from the eye. Walk it back to my collar. Make a nice, easy box. So I have a, just a super simple head here. Flat bottom, sloped it up to the top. My edges are super loose and rough. Um, and I'm just going to take some more off the top. I'm going to do these 45. I'm going to come in at a 45 right here. And just soften that edge. I don't have like a true 90 hard 90 right there to kind of cut down and show you but just going to soften that edge up and then I'm going to come in and show you the magic with the scissors here. Something to be just aware of um, you know your deer hair density is going to it's going to impact the movement right you tie that too dense it's going to be a little bit more buoyant that's not something I'm super concerned with because I'm going to be fishing an 8 weight and a 300 grain full sinking line probably 12 pound test mono and a, you know a two foot leader 
Um, if you do this sparser, you can get similar actions by lighter lines, 200 grain line. Fish it on a six weight, fish it with eight pound test in a non-slip loop, right? The thinner diameter um, lead or leader is gonna have less water drag. It's gonna give that fly more head movement, right? Um, and obviously that non-slip loop knot's also gonna give it more head movement, but it's just things to be aware of. Um, the original cougars actually spun, intended to be relatively loose and shed water. Um, I do mine quite a bit denser because um, I really like this buoyant hover they get when they get the tail kick. Um, and I fished this guy for smallmouth, so just things to be aware of and think about. Um, but I'm gonna come in here now, I'll show you the scissors. So we have a roughly shaped head here. I'll try to zoom this in and show you what's going on. So I'm going to come in, and this to me is against the grain. Going from back to front with the grain would be front to back. The hair wants to slick back, right? That's not a very aggressive cut. It's hard to do it accurately. But if you can go against the grain with your scissors, I'm going to do straight up. You can see this is a vertical cut. I'm going 90. I'm parallel with my hook shank. And then I'm going to come straight over 90 degrees and make that flat. Right? We're making a box, but kind of in a different orientation. You flip the fly around, you can do the same cut. You can mirror the cut, right? Because if you do, you can keep the fly in the same orientation. You have an aggressive cut and a non-aggressive cut. Or you can do an aggressive cut and rotate it in an aggressive cut, right? That's how you pair the head. Super nice. Come in, get that with a 90, clean up around the eye. You can do it with a blade, a razor blade, but it's kind of easy with scissors. And then you want to shape this edge right here with about a 45 and start on the outside. Don't be super intense with it, but just do that so you get a nice rounded profile. You see that? Rotate the fly back, hit that with 45. And that's fishing right there. That, that head's going to fish. You can see my angles are a little off here. I'm just going to re-match my angles. But that head's going to fish absolutely beautifully. Uh, you don't really need to do anything else. I like to come in after that. And I'll just kind of clean up that underside. I have some loose uh, fibers that kind of bleed into my collar. And this is just personal. Doesn't actually change anything. Just helps the photography. Cool, so that's your cougar head. Now something about this head, right? And I'll get this back in the vise. Well, I need to cut one more thing. So I talked about a way to stabilize it, right? You have that super ultra flat, uh, that flat bottom is gonna help stabilize it. Um, something that's a very important trigger is belly wobble. It's belly roll, right? Wounded fish don't track perfectly straight. They wobble and they roll and it's, they're losing kind of control over I'd say bodily functions, but they just kind of, you know, they're loose and they get pushed around by current because it's like they're sick and wounded. They don't have the energy. You see what I'm saying? A little bit of belly wobble can go a long way in making a fly fish better, especially when you have a big flashy belly like that and that wobble's gonna reflect and scatter light, right? Um, super kind of important trigger. And what you wanna do is you just wanna round out that bottom. You take a bottom that's super flat and you kind of oh, <laughs> take a bottom that's super flat and you kind of round it out and it wobbles, right? Stable, like flat, flat, wobble. It's rounded, it's really hard to show you with my fingers. That was probably not the best example, but you wanna be super gentle. You don't wanna just cut off your bottom here, but if you can soften that edge, soften those bottom edges, round them out, it'll get some really good belly wobble in your cougar that'll help it fish. Right, so there's our, our head shape. Nice, wide profile, bleeding directly into our collar. You can see the super flat bottom, but it has rounded edges, right? Um, yeah, more material on top. This head shape right here, if you just look at it, the flat bottom and the kind of steep little crest here, it's like a miniature diver head, right? And it's gonna help that fly kind of dig and deflect every time it goes under. 
Um, and then obviously you have the buoyancy and all that good stuff. Now you can do eyes on this. I'll, I'll have eyes on. Um, I probably won't do eyes on it, but you can do eyes on this. I like to use gel super glue anytime I'm working with deer hair. So the same gel super glue, Loctite gel that was in um, the gel part of the jerkfly tutorial. And then you just coat that with a UV uh, resin, diamond frying. Uh, Flex is perfect for coating that and then curing that into the deer hair. It's actually super crazy durable because um, that resin will seep over your edges and down into your hair and that gel super glue seeps down in the hair. Um, you rarely lose eyes on, on deer hair flies like that. Um, but yeah, that's your zoo cougar head. That's a stacked head, white bottom, tan top. Um, I'm just going to come in and spin a head real quick and spin a collar real quick. And I'll show you guys. We'll, I'll walk you through that real quick and then we'll be on our way. Cool deal guys, so I'm coming in, this is actually a, an arctic fox winged hot fuzz variation and we're going to stack, no we're not, we're going to spin, <laughs> we're going to spin a miniature Buford head, it's kind of going to be like a fat head or a bulk head style, um, flying we'll go over uh, just basically how to tie it so that it's stable and, and then um, and how to shape it and stuff like that. And then at the end, I'll kind of go over how the fly swims, um, all of them, including the cougar head, why they swim that way, um, and then some considerations for substitutes and stuff like that. So, I already got my collar. I'm gonna do the collar on top. If you do like a pike size or a musky size beef for dead, I actually prefer to spin my collars 306 degrees, um, but on this trout fly, um, I'm gonna keep it mostly top or bottom. I'm gonna do about the same length. I like a, you know, a good third of the body. You guys are going to be really good at doing collars by the end of all this, but come up, you know. I'm going to let the zoo cougar collar speak for itself here, and we'll just get this guy tied in. So something you can see, um, and especially when I get this cleaned up, but this has about... Uh, a sh an extra hook eye worth of shank length between my collar and my hook eye. And that's simply because I'm going to do two spun um, sections of deer body hair. Um, I really like two, uh, doing two of them that kind of help support each other and create a nice uh, wide flared head. You can usually, uh, when you spin deer hair, it's quite a bit easier to work with um, in terms of doing it sparser. Uh, typically when you stack, you typically stack a, a decent amount of hair that's uh, quite dense. Um, but when you stack, you know, when you only do one stack on the cougar head versus two spun stacks, it's about the equivalent amount of hair in terms of buoyancy. Um, so that's, you know, people always think if you stack hair, it's like, it's more buoyant. Um, and that's because you can stack hair and then stack another stack on top of that and stack another stack on top of that. You can stack like five pencils worth of deer hair and get super buoyancy. Um, but we just did, you know, a pencil on pencil and a half on top and a pencil and a half on the bottom, right? And I'm going to do basically a pencil and a half spin and a pencil and a half spin. So it's really the same quantity of hair, same buoyancy and all that stuff. Um, but it is certainly easier, in my opinion, to do a spun head sparser, um, especially in, in being able to kind of shape it and make it look the way I want and get the push I want and all that stuff. So I'm just kind of cleaning up my collar. It's a little dense. I might trim it down with the razor blade. But I'm going to show you just real quick how to spin deer hair. Um, and this is a little bit different than how most people do it. Um, it's kind of modeled after Bob Popovic's uh, technique for distributing bucktail. Um, kind of paired with a video I saw Kelly do. Um, and he talked about pushing his material hand into his vise as he went to spin it. And it kind of gave me a little revelation here. And I'll share it with you guys. If you've seen my spinning deer hair tutorial, same technique as in that tutorial. Um, it's a little much. So I got my deer hair off the hide, combed out, none of the crap in it, and the tips being right here are cut. Um, so that, because we're not going to use those fibers, right? I'm going to rest that basically on my collar 50-50, grab it at the midpoint. Nice loose wrap, right? Add some tension, loose wrap, add some tension, loose wrap, add some tension. Now what I'm going to do, and I'll back this out so that you guys can see this, but I'm going to switch hands, let go. Left hand goes on the bobbin, right hand supports your hook eye, thumb pushes down on top and distributes that, and then I support the hook eye and flare it. And I'll walk you through real quick. I wanted you to see all that, and we'll get this bag zoomed in here. Um, but I wanted you to see all of that. Um, and so what you did is you had your hook shank, you put all the hair on top, 
you switched hands, you pushed it with your thumb, and then circled the hook, and then you spun it. And it's the way I've found um, to kind of spin hair and get it better, more evenly uh, distributed. Because one of the things I always struggled with is when you put hair on top and then they say to lightly uh, pull it and it's supposed to pull itself around the hook and you get one clean spin, I always ended up with more hair on one side of the hook than the other and my heads were never um, equal. They were never, you know, paired in density. I always had more hair on one side of the hook than the other. I'm using that really simple technique of, of pushing your thumb down into it having a hard time bringing my thread through here. Um, it really helps that hair distribute around the hook and then you spin it and you get a really nice clean uh, spin that's evenly distributed and it makes for a really consistent head that's going to be easier to trim in my opinion. So yeah, I got my thread out in front. I'm just going to walk it back and we're going to get a second spin on there, right? This should help you uh, with your sex dungeon heads, right? And I talked about doing a spin at the hook eye. Um, it's a, just a good thing to practice here, but I got about equivalent amount of hair, you know, a pencil or so, pencil and a half, cleaning out the butts, gonna cut the tips. And you can see this is a little bit faster, it's a little bit easier in my opinion than stacking, but stacking, you get the white bottom, you can obviously do different color tones, you can do yellow and stuff like that, create hot spots at your throat, uh, you could do red. Um, just allows you to have greater control um, not when you're using it not for the purpose of density but you're using it for the purpose of color control you have obviously more control over that so so I'm just gonna kinda pull this back push that up top grab that at the midpoint right and the same with the dungeon head the trick to this is pulling out only the amount of thread you need so that when you come underneath um, you're, you're catching your hook shank and then you're gonna pull out some more fibers catch your hook shank, pull out some more fibers, catch your hook shank, and it's gonna help you trap the least amount of hair. I mean, it's super useful. Switch hands, push that down, support your hook eye, flare it, and you have a nice clean spin right at the eye. Push all that back, add some tension to that, we'll find our hook eye here. And then I'll use that paper bag trick to help secure all that down. Cool. So that's our, our loose head. Now when I do this in a, a pike or musky size, um, I really uh, emphasize trying to catch that at the midpoint perfectly 50-50 and then I basically don't have to trim it. Um, this is not obviously perfectly even and we'll have to trim it a little bit, but that's just something to be aware of. You don't have to be uh, super technical with trimming hair. If you can catch it perfectly 50-50 and cut it to the length you want, you don't actually have to trim the head. Um, but again, I like to push my fingers, pinching, top and bottom and then sides, right? Helping that hair to kind of fill out and even out and uh, create a just really fullness. You want it to be perfectly round. You don't want stacks and top and bottom and any inconsistency. It'll help get rid of any inconsistency. And then I'm gonna basically, um, maybe I'll try to cut this in the vise. To be honest with you, I'm kind of freestyling this head. I don't really have a specific head design in mind other than yeah, I'll, I'll trim it with a razor blade. See, I don't, I don't really know. But this is how you spin hair. That's the most important thing. This is how you spin hair. Um, and so we'll kind of go over shapes here. Um, but basically, you, if you have a thick enough wire hook, you can do a perfectly circular head. If you have a lighter wire hook, you can move the head so that it's perfectly circular higher. You see what I did there? You can still trim it so that it's circular, but you move it higher, and that way you put your buoyancy above your hook shank, add some stability, or you can uh, do kind of per perfectly circular um, up top and then kind of cut your bottom flush, which is kind of like a sluggo head. Um, so we'll kind of do that. I'll probably trim the bottom with a razor blade, and then I'll come up and roughly shape that, but it's probably gonna be scissor work, more like a bulkhead. So I'm gonna back this out so you can kind of see um, some razor blade work here. But that's what you need to understand conceptually um, and the rest is just going to be practice. Now the difference between this and the Zoo Cougar head, right, the Zoo Cougar head is very compressed um, and it has a slight diver uh, contour profile to it to help plunge it a little bit and get some pretty erratic action especially in a sinking line. Um, but this is mostly supposed to imitate a very fat round head. This is more of your water push style head. It's going to be a lot more aggressive, a lot more push and kick to it. Um, the Zoo Cougar heads, and some, and some we'll talk about in the jig video um, with sculpin helmets, but being flat they like to surf. They will literally surf on currents 
Um, and this is going to be much more aggressive kind of plug and stop tail kick style fly. Um, and oftentimes if you do it aggressive enough, it'll, it'll kind of have a jerk fly action to it just in the way the head sheds water and wobbles left and right. Um, and so I've already cut this, uh, so the bottom's a little bit flatter. You can see that contour is right underneath there. Um, and something I wanted to mention real quick, because I talked about how you could catch it 50-50 and leave it untrimmed, right? Now when you do a, a, a Buford head and you get this really flat vertical leading edge, the more aggressive and flat your edge is, the more push it is, the more aggressive the kind of distribution is because it has a perfectly uh, kind of flat surface to build up water pressure on right and it'll build up and shed it wants to shed the pressure so the head wobbles and it deflects and it has a lot more uh, push going over the top of the fly if you round that out um, with your scissors so that it's more of a bulkhead um, you won't notice it as much in the trout flies because they're smaller and they have less water drag but if you do that on a musky size fly and you round this head out the action is not nearly as much because the leading edge is not nearly as intense the more flat and intense that leading edge is the more push it has as you slope it back the water tends to go it, you know, it, it contours the head and around the body. It doesn't have this extremely abrupt surface that it runs into and stops. Um, so that's not good or bad, it's just things to be aware of. The more viscous your fly is, the bigger it is, the, you know, uh, the longer tailing materials, the bulkier it is, the flatter you're going to want that surface to be. Um, nice, sparse, limp ostrich and breathable fox and a, a collared body like this, you, you're going to be able to shape and around that head out and get a similar action. Um, and it's going to track a little bit truer, and, and, and it's not, if you, if, you, if you trim this head too flat and too aggressive, the fl whole fly will just crumble on itself, and you won't get a, as much of a tail kick, it'll just boom, like big ball of feathers, right? Which I want it to maintain that silhouette with the tail kick and be aggressive, um, but I don't want it to collapse necessarily to that extreme, so I'm going to round out the top. Just things to think about. Something that's extremely um, useful when you're trying to shape a head like this, if you just go into the head, uh, you'll kind of push your hair down um, and it's kind of hard to get the shape you want. But if you come at your head from the side moving over the top, so coming from my side moving over the top with a 45 degree razor blade, you see I'm kind of like holding it at an angle going up and down. Um, it enables you to shape that rounded edge much easier than if you are to go into the hair. If you just go directly into the hair, it's really hard to get that shape. But if you come around the top of the fly and even that out and go down, it's a lot easier to trim um, because that hair, like if you push into the hair, the hair is going to fall back. But if you come at it from the side, it can't deflect and bend out of your way, right? To the same extreme. Um, so it's just, it's easier to contour it that way. And obviously I do come at it from the front, right, to get my initial shape. Um, and then I come from the sides to kind of trim it up and even it up and, and shape it the way I want. So That's not a fixed rule. It's just something to, to play with and help you get the shape you want. Um, it's something I noticed tying backs, bass bugs. The looser my hair was, the easier it was to come from the side. Um, the tighter it is, the easier it is to kind of come right up front. So thought that might help. So you'll find um, loose hair like this because it's it's a you know it's spun it's not spun super tight and we're cutting it uh, pretty far away from our, our hook uh, shank here so we have quite a bit of material that's it's, it's just looser it, obviously the farther you come out from the hook shank the looser the fibers are right um, but you'll find that it, it, some of these fibers are really hard to trim with a razor blade um, and I just want to encourage you if you come in with scissors put a hand your non-scissor hand on your vise somehow to support you can see I have a hand on the vise, I have a hand right here or uh, fingers um, to support how your scissors lay because if you just try to hold them up here and you wobble and you accidentally slip into your hair and cut a chunk off man you'll be mad at yourself um, but if you can support your scissors uh, with your non-scissor hand um, Usually you can be pretty confident that you're not going to slip and, and make a mistake and kind of ruin your head at that point. That's about as good as I can get that. I'll turn off my light here and show you guys, but this is just a supersized muddler head, and you can see it's the same shape even as a cougar head. Um, 
with a lot more volume, a lot more water push. It's not designed to ride on currents, but to kind of push through them and then have that accentuated uh, really over that Arctic Fox wing and, and through my ostrich tail on this kind of hot fuzz um, Arctic Fox variant. So I'll zoom in on this guy, show you uh, the dimensions, and then I'll just kind of talk real quickly about some materials that you can do this with. And yeah. All right, so here's the side profile. You can see just how tall that is compared to how thin my kind of cougar my cougar head is right and this is you know you're looking at the top profile the shape's the same but that has so much more volume to it uh, kind of flat bottom here and i'll show you the the kind of hook eye view and that that's it's all designed to push water um it's really just like a fat head it's a monstrous uh, muddler. It's just a monster muddler. You could call it the monster muddler. That'd be a cool pattern. Hot fuzz variation, monster muddler. Um, but that's the head design right there. Just nice spun. Uh, again, with that rounded head on a slicker tail, it's going to have the appropriate amount of water push versus a really flat, abrupt head um, on a longer bug, bigger bug, uh, wider profile, more viscous uh, tailing materials. You're going to want that more. Um, kind of straight up and down Buford style head uh, to really get that to swim correctly. I guess not correctly, but more aggressively and have a, a greater water push. Um, so yeah, that cougar head, uh, real quick here, that cougar head is totally designed um, to kind of surf and cut and wobble and ride currents. Um, my, what my favorite fly, uh, if I was to have to choose a sculpin um, of one of my designs, it'd be the skinny dipper. I absolutely love that fly in a full sinking line, which is weird because people think it's a mouse pattern, but it's a sculpin goby juvenile sucker pattern. But anyway, um, so yeah, you know, you can get that, that flat head is going to do a lot of riding and surfing. Most of the water pushes in the collar. Still has enough uh, viscosity to slow down with the tail kick and it has that neutral buoyancy hover to it, which is phenomenal. Um, the mega muddler head, uh, basically you supersize those properties. More aggressive push, more aggressive stopping action, um, more buoyancy, so more lift and hover. Uh, and then your aggressiveness is basically how flat the front surface is, um, especially if you do like a mini Buford, which if you tie it in perfectly 50-50 and you cut it to length, you don't have to trim it. So practice that because it's a really easy way to do it supersized. Um, when you get out of the non-buoyant materials, uh, you know, you're looking at strong fuzzy fiber heads, you can do them super dense, ton of water push. You basically base uh, the shape, which this is lightly sculpted, it's basically a bulkhead, but you 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 get the, the, the mechanics, the water push properties and deflection and hover based on how dense you do it in the dubbing loop. So you just play with your density based on your size to get the correct uh, density to length proportion ratio. Um, and then the other thing you can do and you see it a lot is dubbing heads, um, a weightless dubbing head that's really big that's not trimmed at all. It has a very similar action to a lot of these water push bugs and you can do it over light lead eyes. It'd be more in the articulating style just from the weighted perspective but you can do light lead eyes or, or uh, bead chain eyes or something that's not going to be as heavy like medium bead chain eyes uh, with this kind of unkempt dubbing head that has a lot more push to it um, just from the density and how bulky it is. So. That is swim bugs. Um, I'll leave you with this actually because this is important. I'm looking at my camera battery which is probably going to die. So if there's a pause in this, that's what happened. But um, talking about D&Ds, drunken and disorderlies, um, talking about SIDS, and I'll talk about this thing real quick. This is something I learned the hard way. Um, when I first tied this thing, my heads weren't perfect and the bugs swam better. The better my heads got, I got them wider, rounder, and, and tried to give them more volume contouring my head, the more my action went from a juke and jive fly to almost a, it would almost turn over on itself. That's not what I wanted. I wanted the juke and jive, right? And, it, and, and you'll see Andreas do this, and you'll see uh, Tommy Lynch do this, but when they tie on a bent streamer hook, their heads aren't these round, um, zoo cougar heads, but they turn them into triangles. They turn them into a wedge. And the reason why they do that is so the water pressure that builds up on that head of the fly, it'll deflect. And you'll get a, a juke and jive instead of a spoonbill. It almost flips under itself. Um, the reason why I like the spoonbill effect on, uh, say, like a chunky dunker is because the wiggle tail has so much drag that it doesn't physically go all the way under, but you can 
get it, it it'll it has enough tail drag that it doesn't function like that right so it's, but so that's something to be aware of if you tie this thing or if you tie drunken and disorder if you tie sids um if you give them too wide of a head they'll just turn under themselves. They need a place, uh, they need an imperfect head, they need more of a tighter wedge so the water pressure can deflect off the sides and you'll get more of a diver bug instead of a whatever that would be. But that's not what you want. Um, that's not what I want. You can do it what you, you like. But that's something I, I learned the hard way in my own time um, from thinking I had this great idea and I tried to perfect it, but perfecting it made it worse. Um, so you, you kind of want a narrow head on this thing. Basically, and that's why six millimeter eyes are the bomb. Don't go any bigger um, and try to keep that dubbing sparse around the eyes and then bigger once you hit the um, hidden double barrel popper. So that's something I'll leave you with to think about. Um, and the reason why those hooks, in my opinion, are bent down is because they fish immediately. So you can take these buoyant uh, flies that typically would smack the water and have a second to wait because you, you gotta wait for your full sink line to pull them under or at least get low enough that when you strip it, it'll pull them under. Um, but those bent uh, eye streamers, the SIDs and the D and Ds and this thing, as soon as they hit and you tug them because that hook eye is bent, they'll go whoop and they'll slip under. So you can fish a swim bug immediately um, if you tie it on a bent hook like that. And the only technical difference is the hook's bent. You don't, there's no difference in how you tie it. Um, you just shape the heads into more of a wedge instead of a, a rounded uh, kind of sculpiny sucker zoo cougar head. So that's what I'll leave you with. Thanks for watching episode four, part three, swim bugs. Um, see you guys shortly in jig flies. Uh, hopefully I'll have uh, shorter sections and more heads. We'll do like a, a cone head and a bait fish head and a sculpin helmet and just like a hidden cone head. So it'll be like four heads or something like that. Um, and then we'll have a discussion on how to come up with an infinite amount of flies to fill your niche space so you're prepared for any situation on the water, which is the infinite fly principle, which is probably not as cool as you think, but I'm building up for a lot of hype. So, check it out.